May God's peace be with you and assalamu alaikum. My name is Dilara Saeed and I'm president of the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. Civic justice is inspired through story, achieved through action, and codified through policy. This is what we're focusing on throughout the day today. Our American Muslim story, which is where we'll start, is complex. It's vibrant and it's complicated. It tells of people that come from every race, class, and background. I'll start with my American story. On the timeline you have on the screen and in the chat, our story, our family story, begins in the 1950s, a time of great change at conflict with entrenched traditions, of civil rights trying to forge the right to build a life for every American. Within this complicated context, my father-in-law immigrated as a student. He was learning from his professors, but also learning about being American from allies and friends who were Black, Brown, Tan, every race, color, and faith. And they were learning about him from his roots and his background. A few years ago, we were sent a newspaper from 1965. It was a half page spread in the McLean County Times. Why did they have a half page spread? Because the Saeeds were the first family in town. The first Indian family in town got their names and their photos in the newspaper. Even back then, it led to a lot of curiosity and some veiled hate. This story, my story, and many others is why we do this work. Remember, civic justice comes from stories achieved by action, codified by policy. We do this work to ensure the American Muslim story and the promise of American protections and rights apply to each of us and our neighbors across the nation. Today, our American and Muslim family is four generations, and we're not alone. For Joy, the story begins over 150 years ago when her enslaved ancestors helped build this nation. For Chris, it continues today in his family's quest to become documented. For Mina, it is the raising of her new baby, a new generation of Muslims. For Sarah, it is the publishing of her new children's book, her legacy in print. When did your American Muslim story begin? As you heard from our friends at ISPU, American Muslims come from all different backgrounds. The idealist idea of one ummah takes its form today in many voices, through many organizations such as yours, and across many rural and urban suburban neighborhoods across towns, states, and cities. Muslim Americans might be some of the poorest families in this nation, but they're also some of the wealthiest families and philanthropists in this nation. American Muslims may be completely integrated in their blocks and neighborhoods, and yet many will feel completely isolated. We come as card-carrying NRA members. We're also ardent gun law advocates. We vote at every point on the political spectrum from far left to far right and everything in between. And in some states and counties, we can swing the vote. Some of us are religious stalwarts and others of us consider ourselves spiritual lightweights. Our community is not what it was 30 years ago. We're large, diverse, and growing. 
it's not enough to tell our story alone anymore. It is not enough to know that we are diverse. We must respect and advocate our own diversity within our community, within our Muslim community, as well as within the greater American community. We need Muslims and masajids and community centers and organizations that advocate and support our own challenges, diversities, and issues, and celebrate them. Today, our strategy must change. Laws and policies must codify our story. Again, civic justice is inspired through story, achieved through action, and codified through policy. We will have masjids that take care of our spiritual growth and welcome those with special needs, different backgrounds, and all classes. Today, we need empowering social services that understand the challenges that we face across the spectrum of health, class, systems. And today, we need and have specialized civic justice strategies that then codify our stories. This conference and gatherings like this bring together hundreds of partners and allies, all of your organizations, activists and influencers. We need grassroots organizing combined with regional leadership, combined with national strategy. No one level does it alone. And we need to tell the story that is the story of all of us as Muslims. And then again, as I said, codify it into policy. So this section of the conference is very hands-on as the last one was. We're gonna be focusing on strategy for building policy and laws for the most diverse community, ours. First, my colleague, Nadia Muzaffar will share a case study of how our team at the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition builds a template for legislative advocacy. We ensure policies made for us are made with us, and we pass law after law each year. Then our colleagues at the Arab American Institute, led by Maya Berry, will share the case study of the intersectionality between our identity of Muslim and race and ethnicity. She'll talk about the inaccuracy of how we are portrayed in the US census as Arab Americans often categorized as white. And she'll talk about what we need to do to prepare for the 2030 census together. And then Delegate Sam Rasool of the state of Virginia will share how we can build strategy and pipelines for equitable elected and appointed representation. In the end, public officials and leaders should understand us, should know us, but some must also look like us. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. Please add your questions onto the chat, whether in Facebook or on Zoom, and we'll make sure that we're able to ask a few questions after the presentations. Let's get started with Madia Muzaffar, Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dilara, for such a uh, thorough introduction of our community. I am so humbled and excited to speak to all of you today, and I'm, I'm just so inspired by everything that we heard earlier this morning, the significance of the need for policy, the significance for recognition of how unique our community is, and how we have to show up as ourselves um, unapologetically. I wanted to show you um, just a case study in Illinois. I am Maria Muzaffar, I'm the Director of Advocacy and Policy. Uh, I have a fellow, uh, Khushbu Patel Advocacy and Policy Fellow. 
Uh, we have a small team and our team is focused on taking what we learn from who our community is, the statistics of who we are, and then resulting in a legislative change that serves our community. Next slide, please. So very quickly, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition has six different areas of work, um, advocacy and policy, voter engagement, uh, census and redistricting, engage and impact leaders and officials, civic leadership, capacity building, Illinois Muslims report that includes demographic needs and assets. But I want to just use these three statements to boil down what they all encompass, and which is that we believe, as Delara said, policies made for us must be made with us. Uh, we also get out the vote, GOTV, for ethical leaders and just laws, because we believe if we're going to have a role in making sure who gets elected, we need to have a role in making sure what they are spearheading on our behalf. And public officials must know us, understand us, and some should look like us. And I think the way you walk into a legislator's uh, office is very, very critical, and the relationships you build based on sincerity uh, serve you long term. Next slide, please. So we have a very um, specific process in Illinois for advocacy and policy. And, and the reason is that we want this system to be replicated. The whole purpose of this is to be able to be a template for other states. So we specifically don't assume that we know everything that we need to know about our own community. And I will say it's that many times, as many of you in the audience are individuals that are active in the community, that are activists, and are on the ground, it's easy for us to assume that we know every angle of what impacts our community. So we never wanna take that for granted. So we host and listen um, um, with other organizations, our community organizations, and find out what the main issues are. We identify them, and then where we actually play a very different role is that we map out a legislative response. And what I mean by that is that we identify the issue but before we go to a legislator and say, okay, this is an issue that we have, uh, how can you help us? We actually come up with the solution ourselves. We do the research, we draft a legislation. So literally it's like creating a solution to a problem that someone can take the lead on in the legislature. After that, we develop a legislative strategy because of course you can write a legislation, you can come up with a solution, but if you don't know how to get to the finish line, you're gonna fail in the middle, right? So we need to make sure that we know how we're gonna frame it, who our partners and allies will be within our community and outside of our community, um, when we're going to uh, introduce it in what chamber, which legislator we're going to really work with in committee and, and what are the talking points for it. And key community partners and allies can be on the front line on the ground to really educate people uh, as partners with us. And then lastly, we find the legislative sponsor. And I would say that this is very, very similar to when you have a startup and you're looking for a funder, right? Because you have a startup, you believe in what you really, really want to create, and all you need is money. But you cannot make the mistake of getting the wrong funder. So you need to find a legislator in the same way that it's not enough for someone to just say, okay, I'll champion your cause. We wanna know why you wanna champion the cause. We wanna know who is in your community where it really, really affects you. What is the demographic of your community? And then what is your uh, record to follow through? And so I think those things are very, very necessary when you analyze. A, a lot of pause and analysis uh, takes part in this process. And then you follow the legislative process to create law. I think we all know about how a bill becomes a law because we probably learned about it in civics in elementary, but um, there's two chambers and each chamber has a committee uh, on subject matter hearing sometimes and the committee needs to vote it out and you have to lobby all of those legislators and you have to get it to the finish line and have the governor sign it. Next slide, please. Yay. All right. So case study. Here is the case study for Illinois that we want to share with you, right? How did the Illinois Muslim community, alhamdulillah, pass three laws and one resolution and support a dozen other organizations in one session? That's the question we want to have. Next slide, please. 
So there's a couple of guiding principles before we dig into the really exciting, cool laws that are in place in Illinois. Uh, and these principles we really stick to because they actually create a template for, for how we guide our conversation and our relationships. Number one, and this was stated a little bit earlier in the morning, so, so we have a lot of, uh, you know, love for that uh, notion. We don't ask for permission. We come as equal partners to the process. We believe policy should be based on what is needed and not what is politically feasible. So if it's if it's always going to be about, oh, this is not the time, that's not the route we're gonna take. We're gonna take the route of what is important. We know legislators respond to numbers and expertise. So we make sure we have numbers and we definitely, definitely wanna come in as experts. We assume no ill intent on any legislator we meet. And this is very critical too, because there's a lot of baggage about how legislators are perceived um, and how different organizations have, have, have kind of characterized them. But we always want to start a blank slate. We, we're not ignorant about the record, but we always want to feel that legislators are there to make a difference. And, and we really state that when we enter our conversations. We build diverse coalitions. We have over 50 partners and allies. We use a grassroots organizing arm that we created, Illinois Mobilize, to not only lobby with legislators, but also on the ground and file witness slips and everything else that needs to be done. And then we create advocacy temp templates for states across the nation, because if Illinois can do it, we, we feel it can happen around the world. And, and that is our, our biggest goal. Next slide, please. This is such a snapshot. Uh, instead of uh, all of you just looking at text, we felt that the pictures really can impact how you can see the impact of these laws. And um, I just want to state that these are also the little postcards that we use to talk to legislators and educate our partners and allies, and it had an incredible, incredible, incredible impact. Um, Cross-cultural mediation among students, we know, as we heard earlier, that there's a lot of bullying, uh, specifically for bias-based bullying. So we literally wanted to address that issue, inclusive athletic attire uh, act. We wanted to make sure that Muslim athletes were able to continue and play sports and be welcome on sports field, no matter what their accommodation looked like or the need was. Um, Muhammad Ali Day resolution, making sure that January 17th was a Muhammad Ali Day and the contributions and history of Muslims in America. So this is a snapshot of images. Next slide, I'm gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So now I'm going to get into a little bit of a text. Okay, so the Inclusive Athletic Attire Act, actually, we wrote as a legislation that not only modified uh, uniforms for Muslim students, um, but generally for all faith based communities that wanted to be modest or anybody that wanted to modify their uniforms and not only girls, but also boys. So it, were, it was very applicable to interfaith communities. And many people we got calls from parents that were simply saying we don't like the volleyball uniforms anymore, right? So a lot of these things made sense outside the Muslim community and that is the winning formula because we wanna address issues as wide um, as we can for the whole state. SB 564, Contributions of Faith in America. Of course, again, just like HB 120, it's the first in the nation, which basically means that in K through eight US history curriculums across the state in Illinois, now the contributions of Muslims will be taught in US history. And uh, obviously this was, again, uh, we heard a few of these uh, stories in the beginning of this uh, conference, but there were uh, cases where students felt like they were outsiders. In fact, there were students who were being taught of material on 9-11 where they felt that it was biased and, and unfair and made them feel like they were targeted. So how better than to include a community than to teach others about how their community is already part of the U.S. story. We also added Muhammad Ali as a commemorative holiday in January 17th. So now every year there's a Muslim American, a proud African-American Muslim uh, that will be celebrated uh, across the state. And cross-cultural mediation, I touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to dive into this because what we actually saw in these bullying cases is that detention and suspension had a role, but it did not solve long-term relationships or problems. So we, what we wanted to do is if your child had bias-based bullying, that they would have the option of mediation. In fact, mediation would be sanctioned, right? Would be mandated. So if you're a parent where your child has been bullied for wearing hijab or being Muslim, separating the two, uh, the bully and the victim, it's fine, but how powerful would it be if you had to have mediation, uh, absent physical harm and physical danger, you had mediation where the victim can actually empower themselves in this story. 
And then we went to the next one. Okay, we went to the next one. But um, so those are the different language um, critical changes that we made to make sure that we reached the finish line. Right now we have a full plate, but two major things that we are looking at, we got, we got them, thanks, we got them in Muhammad Ali. But the two major things that we're looking at right now, which is 2022, uh, is Faith Behind Bars, HB 5455, and Faith by Plate, HB 1574. And what we understood is that when you are incarcerated, um, it is the time where your faith really, really matters. It is your strength. And so we wanted to make sure that Muslims behind bars were able to have access to chaplaincy. Again, we brought in that language. So individuals who are of different faith should have the ability to make sure that they have access to chaplaincy. And this was actually inspired by a case in Alabama, where if you know an individual that was incarcerated was being executed and did not have a chaplain and imam enter. Um, Illinois does not have a death penalty, but we do feel that so many moments chaplaincy should be something that's accessible. Faith by Plate Act is simply stating that individuals that have faith dietary restrictions in state facilities should be have should have the ability to have that type of uh, food. And so that specific bill, we are now uh, pushing for all faiths, and but specifically halal food and kosher food, and we've created an alliance between the two communities to make sure that all state facilities, hospitals, schools, um, prisons, all have um, that type of uh, accommodation made. Next slide, please. And not everything goes the way that, that you expect it to go. And I think that's a major, major lesson for people that do this legislative work is that the interesting and the creative part of it is how do you solve the problem? So to reach the finish line, it may be that you pass a law, but other things may also occur that also result into a different type of finish line. So if you look at Commission on Healthcare and Prisons, which is also a legislation we're working on 2022, we actually moved it to spring session 2023 because where we wanted to house it was not where it was the best fit. So we had communications with state agencies and we built relationships to make sure that we moved it to the right direction. Insurance coverage for healthy foods or cancer patients. This was very critical and very important for us to do because we actually put Muslim physicians um, as leads on this issue. So st the state of Illinois could see Muslim physicians in their role of being frontline workers and being experts in this field. And what we felt is that insurance should cover felt, uh, healthy food, and especially for areas of food deserts. What we actually decided is instead of creating a law, we need to go into the agency and create the uh, program ground up. And so now we are excited to work with Imana and, and different medical organizations, uh, Chicago Medical uh, Muslim Medical Association, to build this ground up one uh, first in a nation um, to be able to the state agencies. And then lastly, Faith Behind Bars. Uh, we moved it to a veto session. So we're going to be saying, inshallah, Faith by Play and Faith Behind Bars in November in the veto session. And we've done all the work to be able to have witnesses for subject matter hearings and have uh, national attention for both issues. Next slide, please. Now, we added the slide because I wanted you to know that we have Dr. Rachel Mahmoud, which was our education task force lead. But we wanted you to know that you can create a legislation in your states that creates a Muslim curriculum that talks about um, the fact that it's mandated, but it will only be effective if you can guide the educators. And so many times there are these mandates which schools don't really like, but if you're able to create a guide, then that makes it a lot easier. So even when we were speaking to legislators, we would say there's actually a task force of diverse educators across the state, many were not Muslim, that came together to create this guide. And so teachers will have this guide, parents will have this guide. And we actually share this in information with the Illinois State Board of Education. And we basically share the fact that we are prepared before we're even before this law even passes. And so that was very, very critical. Next slide, please. And this is key because when you do the work and you do a very public type of action that can be interpreted in, in political divisive environments, you need to know how to relate to the media and how to use the media. And so we had some guidelines as well, and we were very, very disciplined about it. Number one, no pat on the back until success. Many times communities and community organizations will get um, questions and, and leads from inner, from, from, uh, from newspapers and, and journalists 
really wanting to dig into issues. And it's very, very tempting to say, okay, now we can get a word out and now we can complete the narrative. But we really, really feel that until there's success, there's really nothing to talk about. For us, success was uh, when the law is passed. No invitation to distracting and disparaging narrative. This was for the same reason. You know, we didn't want to engage in discussion in the public forum unless it was about education with legislators and community organizations, which we could do ourselves without the media being involved in our um, community sessions and in our WhatsApp groups and in our um, town halls. We were able to have those discussions uh, on our terms, which we really enjoyed, and we were able to gauge that diversity. Share press releases only after passage of laws. That's self-explanatory, right? You have new, share news when you have news. Show intentional leadership in discussing legislations in thoughtful and nuanced manner and not sound bites. And this is very critical for our community because you'll see, hear this again and again that this is too long or this is too complicated and just simplify it, simplify it, simplify it. And we need to have a balance because for us, we are trying to create a nuanced understanding of a complex, diverse community and needs. Nothing should be so simple. Lives are not simple. Um, legislations are not simple. So we want to have that fine balance where we're not falling into this trap where political sound bites are what we're leading into. Because as we know, what we always feel as a Muslim community that things are too simplified, right? People just follow sound bites and form opinions. So we, to be able to move away from that, we have to show leadership in that and take a little bit longer. Use media to educate on the issues instead of seeking accolades. This is this is very, very critical. I think as a community for ourselves, we just need to get in the habit consistently to take every opportunity, even if our community is highlighted or an individual is highlighted, how can we take that and make it an education form so the media understands that the Muslim community is here to educate and not for a pause. Next slide. All right. So I know that was uh, a lot and uh, I, I apologize if I went a little bit over, but we are very, very excited to share this template with you, to share the model with you. We do feel that it's very, very possible to have it in your state. Uh, we'll also be looking at federal legislations. And so we would love to hear from you. Um, you can email us at info at illmuslimcivitcoalition.org and I look forward to the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madia. Um, and you know, we do all these plans and it's with God's grace that we succeed. And so all praise is to our creator who has made this the time for our community um, to do this work and to move the needle forward, um, inshallah, and continue to move it forward together. A question that came up uh, several times in the chat was, um, are, is the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition a registered 501c3 or c4 or PAC? And in this space of civic work, we actually um, have all three types of organizations, right? Actually four types. There are some organizations that are working ad hoc. It's a group of uh, parents or a group of community activists and they uh, or organize through WhatsApp or a listserv, et cetera, great. You can do this work as that. You don't need to be an organization. Remember your power as individual residents and citizens of our nation. Secondly, you could be a 501c3. The Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition and the work that Maddie is describing is through a 501c3. It is a nonprofit tax deductible status in the US. Third, you can do it as a 501c4. That's a nonprofit, but it is not tax deductible. 501c4s can lobby and they can endorse candidates. We also have that at the Illinois stations will be a C3C4 partnership, the Facebook. We have a ilmuslimcivitcoalition.org is our C3 and coalition-activate is our dot org is our c4 engage also has engage usa engage action so there's definitely many organizations that have a c3 c4 partnership lastly you could be a pack in which case you can do all of the above 
and also directly give money to candidates and be political. Uh, we chose not to be a PAC, but there are several organizations that are also a PAC. Engage has a C3, a C4, and a PAC. Maria, a question that came up often in the chat was, um, thank you for this process. You've described it well. How did our community support this process or challenge it? And how did legislators support this process or challenge it? So two kinds of questions about our community and about our legislators. Yeah, um, I thank you for the question. I, I will say this, that this could not be possible without the community. The community supported it and this is why it worked. Um, there were many districts that we identified where there were large demographics of Muslims. We went to them directly. We told them what the legislators um, were going to be voting on and we asked them to mobilize and have conversations with them. When there was a legislator that voted yes, we also asked them to send them emails and thank yous. So that was critical. That's how they helped. How the legislators responded is literally by seeing the fact that there, were, there was a community that knew what they were talking about, was an unapologetic for what they were asking for. And I will say this, I'll use this phrase, you have to create FOMO for legislators because they want to do the right thing and they want to be where the party is. And the party was to make sure that they were making history uh, in the state of Illinois. And so we're so thankful for that. Mm -hmm. I think Maria also gets now, and, and we get that in our briefings with legislators, uh, requests. So what are your laws in 2023? And can I be a chief sponsor of one of them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that what, what's critical is creating that, um, that energy and that anticipation. And so we take full leverage of that. Awesome. So thank you. Again, if you would like more information, all um, workshops and sessions such as yourselves and activists such as yourselves all across uh, the, the nation. So I want to turn now to another critical case study and how the U.S. Census impacts our communities and how we can impact the census being more accurate and more uh, supportive of our needs. Uh, Maya Berry is, um, many of you know, uh, you know, a great friend of our communities, a activist in our community, and the executive director of the Arab American Institute. And really want to thank Maya for joining us today. She'll speak for about 10 minutes on the stu case study of the census, and then we'll talk again about questions. Thank you so much for inviting us uh, to be with you today, and thank you for all the work that uh, you are doing and all my colleagues are doing. Um, I'll start by talking specifically about why it is important to have an accurate count of communities on the U.S. Census. And frankly, I, I had the pleasure of being able to listen into the panel previously on uh, the, the medical care and medical research. And uh, as was demonstrated and highlighted in that panel, data drives policy. And if you don't have accurate data, you're not going to have a policy that serves communities well. So one of the most important aspects of, of the decennial census is that we need to have an accurate count of all of our communities. Um, it, it literally funds the multi-trillion dollar budget, um, the federal budget um, accounts for every single penny that our government spends. It is about how we do uh, uh, apportionment, so political representation. There's really almost no aspect of your life uh, that is not ten, uh, touched by the Census Bureau. Um, and the decennial census, from where English as a second language is taught in a, in a local school to where a, a local community will put up a stoplight or a stop sign. Um, so every aspect is, is there and it's absolutely critical. Um, the meaning category in particular is, is the story of how we come um, to, to this issue. Uh, the Arab American Institute was established in 1985. It is a well-known fact uh, that there is a dramatic undercount of Arab Americans. It's one that the Census Bureau agrees is a problem, which is why the Census Bureau has actually been a partner with us on this journey. Um, the Institute was established in 85, and the first partnership we ever had on the decennial census was in 1990. So it gives you a sense of how long um, this process has been taking and why it's important to do. 
um, it, it, initially, and this is sort of important is it, it, in terms of context, there was an effort to say, why don't we have an Arab American category in the census? But frankly, it was not a category that was inclusive enough. So early on in the process, it was determined that the best way to gather information about uh, communities, from, including Arab Americans, was to create what is called the MENA category, Middle East and North Africa. So it encompasses the uh, Arab American population and that it represents the 22 different mem uh, member nations of the Arab League, plus three, um, and those are Iran, Israel, and Turkey. And coming to MENA, uh, that category is, is it's clear, um, it, it was strategically important to do so because it allowed for a broader coalition to come together and advocate for this category. Now, we're having a conversation sometimes here about identity. And to be clear, the US government doesn't give you your identity. The census is not giving you your identity. We're not creating a MENA category. MENA is a geographical area. And within that, people uh, are then able to identify their national origin. Um, there's much that's said about um, uh, many of our communities um, not identifying as white, um, and even though under the OMB Office of Management and Budget Directive, uh, people from the MENA region are currently classified as white. From our perspective, as again, as highlighted by the previous discussion, uh, we are a very di diverse community, just like the American Muslim community is equally diverse. Um, so for our perspective, it is an ethnic category that we are seeking, not a racial one. Arabs can be black, Arabs can be white, Arabs can be brown. It's it, the, it is an ethnic category, not, not a racial one. So those efforts had been underway for some time. It really took hold in 2010 um, when we began a, a more formal process. By 2015, the U.S. Census Bureau actually tested in its national content test a MENA category, and it was found to improve the count of people from the MENA region. Uh, so when demographers and the experts at the U.S. Census Bureau say this category will improve the count, it generally is perceived to be um, an improvement important development um, in terms of uh, moving forward on that category. We were extremely excited um, going into the 2020 decennial census uh, and really confident that the MENA category would be available to us for the first time. What that would mean is that there would be a MENA checkbox. Folks would be able to check that off and then again within that identify their own ethnicity or national origin. Regrettably, our country saw the most uh, dis the most politicized decennial ever um, during the uh, uh, previous administration, um, and the MENA category was abandoned. Uh, so, a category that had been tested and proven to be uh, uh, accurate, uh, meaning it would improve the count, uh, was abandoned. And instead, the uh, the uh, previous administration was engaged in a process where they were talking about introducing a citizenship question, something that had not been tested and had not been on the U.S. Census decennial census since 1950. So that process, regrettably, uh, really upended um, uh, the progress that had been made over decades, um, and it didn't happen uh, in 2020. Having said that, I will tell you that the work on the MENA category for the 2030 decennial census began before the 2020 uh, process was complete. Um, it is, again, it's helpful in this process when the government agencies that are in charge of this, uh, that oversee this process, understand that there is a problem and have been a partner in attempting to remedy it. Um, so we have had um, uh, meetings with the new census director. We've had meetings with the Office of Management and Budget. We have a broad coalition in place uh, that includes colleagues from uh, the Latino community, the Black community, uh, the Asian American community. It's just a broad coalition in place to is advocate for a uh, data equity and, and getting to a MENA category and improving the count uh, on the census is how we do that. So uh, I'm pretty confident that by, by 2030, we'll, we'll be positioned, well positioned to, to have a MENA category. Uh, I will tell you that though in advance of that, um, the, the this decennial happens um, it, it's incredible how quickly the work on the decennial begins. So there is a, a, a survey called the American Community Survey that goes into local communities um, regular, continuously. It's ongoing. And, and our efforts are already underway to say, how do we get the MENA category added to the, to the ACS uh, in advance of talking about how it gets added uh, to the 2030 uh, decennial? So that, that's, that's the, the sort of 
quick version of how we got to to where we are on Mina, um, and that is, you know, again doing everything right, and then there's an unexpected development, uh, but you still pick up the pieces and you move on and 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 you look to uh, advance it. There is a point though I want to make, um, and that is, of course, you're having the conversation in the context of the American Muslim community, and um, uh, just like um, um, the as I said, the, the American Muslim community is, is very diverse and Arab is not a proxy for Muslim. It is, um, it, it's important to understand that um, we, we, we have from uh, data of some of the presenters today, we know that uh, a plurality of American Muslims are black. Uh, I believe if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, please correct me, but uh, the single largest continuing growth of American Muslims in this country are among the Latino community. Um, so when we talk about uh, getting to a better count in the decennial census, there is the census does do a faith-based outreach uh, effort um, and and those are important so as you think about uh, how we can get to this is having a better count there are ways which we we can partner uh, as american muslim communities um with the census bureau in terms of faith-based approach to outreach when it, it's the get out the count efforts um having said that um it's important to note that uh because of the issue of uh, and i think a very important issue uh of separation of religion and state uh the the census will not ask um in fact it's prohibited by law since congress passed a law back in 1976 to ask a question about one's religion when you receive the census, you're actually required by law to fill out every question. Um, so none of the questions are optional. They're there and you're required to fill them out. So if the government were to ask you about your religion, um, I, I think uh, it's been determined, uh, and, and I would argue perhaps correctly, um, that based on religious liberty issues and the separation of, of religion and state, that uh, the census does not ask a question about one's faith. Um, so there are, I just want to point that out because I think it's important to understand it in this context, but having said that again, uh, for example, when we did polling in our community about how to do our, we did both polling and focus groups about how to reach our community, how to arrive at a, one of the better counts, uh, among the most uh, uh, valuable voices that were determined uh, as, as key to uh, advocate for filling out the census, completing the form, uh, were actually religious leaders, uh, people's individual uh, congregants were, were uh, people's individual, um, either priests or imams, or were, were deemed as uh, important voices, as validators for the, the need to participate in the census. So I think there are ways in which a faith-based approach can be taken here, but important to note that um, uh, there really is a pretty strong line between asking the religion question and the decennial uh, by formal government document. Uh, I will stop there and look forward to your questions and the answers, but thank you again for all the work that everyone's doing. Thank you, Maya, um, and thank you for your and your team's leadership on this. I know that um, the coalition and dozens of organizations, if not hundreds of organizations across the nation, were taking your lead as this work was being done, and it was very important. Um, one of the questions being asked in the chat is, so we're preparing. There should always be a prep time because it's just not going to happen magically where 2030 meets our needs. Right now, we have over 500 um, policymakers, center leaders, faith leaders, et cetera, that have registered for this conference, what should they be doing between now and the next census to prepare and follow your lead? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, on the right now, we're in the phase of, of the policy uh, addressing the policy problem before we get to the get out the count uh, problem. <laughs> um, so right now, we really are engaged directly with the agencies who will be, be uh, making uh, the changes in policy that will allow us for the MENA category to be added. Um, if folks are engaged with their member of Congress, that is always a good thing to do. Talk about the, how you felt when you took the census form. Talk about if there wasn't a box that represented you, what that felt like. And if there was, that's wonderful. I filled it out. This is how it could be better. And it, it just share with those members that, um, you know, the MENA category is something that a broad coalition is working in support of as part of a combined question uh, that we believe will arrive at a better count for all of our communities. So I think that's one thing whenever you talk to a member of Congress, just talk about the importance of the decennial census and the need to add a MENA category on a combined question. Separate from that, I will tell you that uh, I trust that your coalition and 
fathers are going to come to these local communities in no time at all because the the work the preparation work for the get out the count efforts happened years in advance and the partnerships on the state and local levels are how we actually do the census it's it's absolutely critical work that happens in local communities so please just uh look out for when those coalitions come together uh, and those campaigns are put in place and and we really will count on you to be the vehicle uh because you're the trusted voice in your local community I think it's really powerful that you're saying start messaging to our elected officials and our public officials now. And so in the chat, as we did after the last session, we'll also put um, two like talking points. And, and Maya, we, if you could just craft like number one, talk to your legislators and public officials now that we are preparing for the census. Number two, let them know that the decennial census has to reflect the needs of the Muslim community, the vast and diverse American Muslim community that intersects with many races, ethnicities, our community. Um, one of the questions asks and, and states, our community does not participate enough in the census. We are, as you would might state, hard to reach, undercounted, all of the above. So how do we begin now How do we prepare starting now for our own community to be ready for the 2030 census? Because we ourselves um, identify as difficult to reach and hard to count. Yeah, there are many reasons for why community would be considered hard to count. And, and um, it, interestingly enough, actually, uh, the language we using we used to talk about Arab Americans was very similar to what I heard in the previous panel. We are rendered highly visible by U.S. national security policy. We are called as Arab Americans, and certainly one would argue American Muslims as well, are a securitized community. That is, our government's approach to us is viewed through a national security lens. So as a result, highly visible when it comes to certain policies, particularly particularly in a post 9-11 environment and the Patriot Act, but then rendered completely invisible when it comes to data and, and, and the importance of government services and representation. So um, it's yeah. that, that's the, this dichotomy that we find ourselves in here. So the, the work that has to happen is to address that problem. And when we did our focus groups, um, I'll, I'll be honest enough to tell you, I had this whole idea about we really have to be honest with our people and tell them that, yes, we know the government does surveillance in our communities and, and just tackle it directly and address it. And, and this is the messaging we should use. And my idea is completely flopped. The focus groups did not want any of that. They wanted positive messaging about families and younger people. They wanted to make sure kids were counted. So I think you have to acknowledge where the community's at, meet them there, but also understand that, that you know, do your work here. And that and, and from our perspective, it was the positive messaging that worked most effectively. I want to be counted. I want my kids to be counted. I want my grandkids to be counted. I want there to be adequate representation of our community. Mm -hmm. That's really critical. Um, and in, you know, this is a, a policy conference we began this year with five organizations and all of your organizations joining us. In the years to come, we need full sessions on how to approach the census and how, as organizers, we are going to do this work in the next six years, um, because it isn't a 2030 event. It's a starting now towards 2030 and then moving on to redistricting and many of the other ways that census impacts us, including resources, et cetera. So we had a question from Ilhan Kagri, actually a, an insightful comment that said, yes, this is going to be important, but it won't matter unless we have that holistic approach. And this is why in this policy conference, you're hearing from many different policymakers who are working in the healthcare space working in the census space, working in the legislation space. And now we're going to move on to actually um, voting and political representation. Because if that isn't part of all of this, as Ilhan pointed out earlier, we, we may have a, another Trump or another pushback from uh, people who don't support us and maybe on either side, but not supporting us. Um, and so we'd like to move it to uh, Delegate Sam Rasul. Uh, he's a delegate of the Virginia State House and a great friend and also really working towards equitable representation and modeling it in Virginia. I know, again, across the Midwest, across uh, southern states, we're using his model and his template. So, Sam, thanks for joining us and all yours. 
Thank you so much, uh, Delara. It is most certainly a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, this afternoon's now um, uh, presentation. Uh, and let me just say, if every state had an, uh, a, a model organization like the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, I mean, this is exactly what you need in 50 states where you have this kind of involvement, this kind of investment. So kudos to you and to uh, your coalition members uh, taking charge and saying, you know, Illinois is where it's at. And as you saw in your chart uh, that you showed earlier, Illinois has the highest Muslim representation, of Muslim uh, population per capita. And right behind it is Virginia. So I join you from Virginia today with uh, some information for you. So um, in the next slide, you get to see a little bit about uh, me. So they said I'm coming on right before uh, lunch. So I'm part of the uh, show here just to um, keep you awake. I'm the first Muslim ever elected in Virginia history. But where I'm elected is interesting. It's in the foothills of Appalachia. Um, so I get to be the country Muslim. I'm, I'm in the ninth year in the state legislature. I've loved being able to serve, but it was quite a surprise in our election in 2014 when we were able to make some progress. And that uh, it leads us to say that we can win and run uh, just about anywhere. On the next slide, you'll see just how few representatives we have. Uh, so in America, there are over half a million elected officials at the federal, state, and local level. And we only have a few hundred that are actually Muslims. So if we said that 1% uh, of the population were Muslim, you'd roughly say that that'd be about 5,000 uh, individuals. Instead, we have less than one-tenth of 1% 1 who are elected representatives around, uh, uh, around the whole country. And if you think about the appointed positions, that's about a similar uh, representation. So what we need to be doing to build a, a broad pipeline is to keep a few things uh, in mind. If you're looking to run or wanting to be appointed, which is an important part of uh, civic action, uh, think about uh, one of the, the biggest questions I ask incoming candidates are, where do you actually live? The, you just heard uh, excellent presentations, not only from uh, Maria on how to be involved in legislature, but uh, Maya talking about the census. And census is very specific about what census block, what census track, and how these districts then are redrawn. Many times we have candidates who want to be involved, uh, but uh, unfortunately do not uh, know specifically where they live in, in respect to what they can run for. They wake up and say, I want to run. Uh, and uh, for, uh, for many candidates, I say plan in advance where you're going to be rooting yourself. Number two, uh, this is a people business. Uh, while we hear a lot about the, the policy side, remember that uh, you've got to invest in those relationships. Number three, you've got to play the long game. So two things that I want to focus on uh, as we're thinking about uh, building this pipeline are, you know, how do we organize the broad coalitions necessary to make progress? And number two, how do we make our messages stick? So on the next slide, we have some catalyst data around what's called the Peoria Nine. So many times we think about the, the coalitions, um, uh, as you might have seen from one of the presentations earlier, it was kind of the iceberg of what we see, our race, ethnicity, uh, religion, and those types of coalitions. But what I'd really like to focus on uh, is uh, values-based coalitions. Uh, in areas like mine, as well as many others across the country, we uh, are not only trying to build coalitions uh, across race and ethnicity, religion, but we also need to build values-based coalitions. And that is a powerful thing when we can uh, be able to connect people across socioeconomic status, as we heard from the healthcare presentation earlier. In this Peoria 9 information that you see here, instead of looking at everyone in buckets of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, we have nine values-based uh, data. In this, you'll see super seculars, for example, who are not religious, traditional Democrats who are uh, rather uh, religious, paycheck-to-paycheck uh, -paycheck progressives who are thinking uh, that uh, they're very socioeconomically fragile, libertarian left tend to be younger, uh, and very skeptical of government involvement. The new suburbans, are, we've seen a suburban push, especially post-Trump. Nostalgic traditionalists look at uh, the way things used to be, uh, 
uh, and reminisce the merit market vote with their pocketbook identity conservatives are exactly just that and fox loyalists are there to defeat the liberal agenda no matter what but if you look at this and think of the muslim um, uh, contingency we roughly are uh, six out of these nine pretty consistently from paycheck to paycheck progressives to identity conservatives but the key is is how we message uh, and how we build those coalitions are and finding those common values. And each one of these uh, nine have a, a specific set of values. And so if you come into uh, an issue that you're running or a campaign or your candidacy and your candidacy specifically messages to one of the nine, you likely will not be able to build the winning coalition uh, that is needed. So this is very helpful data in understanding and trying to weave uh, all of these together. In the next slide, We'll think about not just building the coalition, but how to make that coalition uh, stick. And making that stick uh, on the next slide talks about the uh, six moral foundations. We will uh, find that there's this book, uh, The um, uh, Righteous Mind. If we could go to the next slide, please. The Righteous Mind, written by Jonathan Haidt, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. What you have here is the moral matrix and the six foundations of morality. Why this is very interesting is that the top uh, leaders, uh, the best communicators, were, are consistently able to appeal to uh, five or six of these six foundations on a consistent basis. So if you really want your message to stick, you're really wanting to make progress in your um, campaign, whether it be from a candidacy perspective or on issues, uh, you've got to keep in mind the best in moral psychology, and, and we'll also touch base on some neuroscience. And if you contrast this liberal moral matrix with the next slide, which it, it shows you the, the moral matrix of a social conservative, uh, go back one slide, please. And you will find uh, that uh, there is a difference in the weighting. So what does this mean here? Well, in these uh, in the calculation of morality, the way we actually connect in a way that, that actually sticks, uh, we've got to make sure that we are uh, messaging in such a way that uh, really appeals to the broadest base. So for example, in these six that you see here, the Care Harm Foundation is a, a piece of uh, morality that says, are we, are we providing the care or is there something that is harming someone? Liberty and oppression speaks for itself. Uh, fairness is something fair or someone cheating. Are we loyal uh, to an institution? Are we respecting authority and then sanctity and degradation, the, the kind of purity of something? This is the calculation in contrasting the liberal one that you saw earlier, which was somewhat of an uh, imbalanced and heavily focused on the Care Harm Foundation. Uh, we find that the successful individuals uh, who are able to communicate like President Obama, President Clinton, President Reagan, and uh, John F. Kennedy, for example, consistently hit on five or six of these um, uh, foundations on a regular basis and had a broad-based appeal. Uh, and so if you're wanting to make your message stick, you've got to uh, keep that in mind. And the last piece on the next slide will be on the, the neuroscience of um, how the science of all of this actually works. So you hear about a lot of the policy that we've, uh, we've just talked about, which is excellent work. And uh, this emphasizes the fact that you cannot discuss policy with individuals or with groups before you've built a relationship with them first. Trust uh, goes to the very heart of the science of how our brain is wired. If you picture the brain as the uh, uh, reptilian brain, and then you've got that kind of more advanced portion uh, everything goes through the reptilian brain first, and it's asking this question, what is the purpose or what is the why of the individual organization in front of me? And then the how are the values with which they are interacting with me? Are they respecting, listening, inclusive? Once I understand and feel comfortable with your purpose and understand and appreciate the values with which you're communicating and connecting, then the reptilian brain allows for inform information flow uh, to the cortex, the, the more advanced part of your brain. And so when, we, when we're trying to take our information, the policies we really care about and just pound people over the head with it, no matter how much sense it makes, it will not work uh, unless you've been able to build that relationship. 
And I could speak to that firsthand as someone being elected here in the foothills of Appalachia with very few Muslim Americans, very few uh, being of Arab American descent myself, because we were able to find and build relationships with a broad base of individuals. And so not only do we wanna understand and have the best policies that we wanna advance, but then figure out exactly how we're gonna be able to implement that. And that's with building some broad uh, coalitions and building the best relationships. So think about those relationships and think about how we're going to make them stick as we uh, build uh, the relationships for the future. And with that, uh, of course, we're happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry, I uh, have you on mute. You spoke really well um, and, and very clearly about that relationship building um, before we do anything like build policy. But a question was asked, even before we do anything like run for office, uh, what we're seeing in the last couple of years is um, running for office in the American Muslim community, especially in the larger areas or in areas where there's deeper population um, supports, uh, it's trendy, um, it's sexy to run for office. And yet you have people running for office um, at higher levels of government that have never been activists in the organizations or people running for office that have um, not really built those relationships with um, labor or the community or to uh, or or the or the neighborhoods or their condominium association or wherever they might be talk a little bit about um, how you decide to run for office and the strategy our community is going to have to employ given finite resources, finite, uh, you know, supports available across the nation? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, and what's important about this is a lot of us have made uh, the, uh, the mistakes. My first run for office was for U.S. House as the youngest congressional candidate in America back in 2008. And that is certainly not how I would advise folks to, to get involved. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of being in certain appointed positions at the local uh, state and federal level. These appointed positions get you into not only certain circles from an advocacy perspective, but also legitimize uh, your, uh, what you bring to the table. Uh, and so when we're thinking about wanting to, to run for office and be involved, um, you know, we, we certainly never wanna tell someone, well, wait your turn, uh, but it, it is important that people do feel that you're in it for the long haul. And if this is a relationship-based relationship business, uh, they wanna know that you've invested in the community and that you're really there for them. And I'd like to, Delara, reference what's at the core of our faith. Our faith isn't even a, a judgment of what actions we take, but of our intention. And the only way I can explain the people giving me a shot here in the Bible Belt of Virginia was that they could feel the intentions that we were coming uh, with. And so hopefully the, the more you can bring those intentions by showing you're vested in the community, the better off you'll be. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I uh, wanted to reiterate um, today, uh, you know, I, I was able to begin by saying that um, uh, civic justice comes uh, when um, we have the um, activism and the policy that connects with the story. And what you saw throughout the day today, but in this section specifically, was connecting the story with the action and with the policy and codification. Um, so Madia Muzaffar of the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, Maya Berry of the Arab American Institute and Delegate Sam Rasool of Virginia um, were all able to help us with this and we'll continue this work in the years to come. We have some action steps for you. Um, right now, primaries are going on across the nation. Uh, I know in our own state, we are heavy in the Illinois primary, which is June 28th. Um, I know that right here in the Midwest, in the East Coast, uh, where we are with MPAC, the primaries are in June. So one, register to vote, check your registration to vote. Because we had redistricting, you have sometimes new places you're gonna be voting and new districts you're gonna be voting for, check all that. Number two, get your sample ballot. We have a website here um, that links you directly. If you put in your address, you'll actually get what your ballot looks like. So before you even go in to vote, you can check and see who you wanna vote for, circle them, take it in with you. And then get others to vote. Let's be honest, 
the 500 or so of us that registered for this conference, I'm speaking to the choir. You've already drunk the Kool-Aid with us. You know the importance of this work, but we all know dozens of family and close friends that aren't doing this work, and we need them to be voting with us. Second, advocacy building in your community. Please, these are replicable. They are not hard. Once we build the system, we just need to do it over and over again. Top 10 states that have the most populous Muslim communities, that's 2 million people right there in our nation. So please email us at info at IL Muslim Civic Coalition, and we will connect you to whichever organization is the best fit for your uh, legislation and policy that you wanna change. And then to learn, of course, more about the Arab American Institute, we have our, their website here. And, um, and of course you can find Sam uh, on his website, samrasool.com. So thank you so very much for joining us. Uh,